there's no shortcut to smart judgment if you want to make the maximum amount of money possible if you want to get rich over your life in a deterministically predictable way stay on the bleeding edge of trends and study technology design and art become really good at something one you don't get rich by spending your time to save money you get rich by saving your time to make money hard work is really overrated how hard you work matters a lot less in the modern economy what is underrated judgment judgment is underrated one can you define judgment my definition of wisdom is knowing the long-term consequences of your actions wisdom applied to external problems is judgment they're highly linked knowing the long-term consequences of your actions and then making the right decision to capitalize on that 78 in an age of leverage one correct decision can win everything without hard work you will develop neither judgment nor leverage you have to put in the time but the judgment is more important the direction you're heading in matters more than how fast you move especially with leverage picking the direction you're heading in for every decision is far far more important than how much force you apply just pick the right direction to start walking in and start walking one how to think clearly clear thinker is a better compliment than smart real knowledge is intrinsic and it's built from the ground up to use a math example you can't understand trigonometry without understanding arithmetic and geometry basically if someone is using a lot of fancy words and a lot of big concepts they probably don't know what they're talking about I think the smartest people can explain things to a child. If you can't explain it to a child, then you don't know it. It's a common saying and it's very true. Richard Feynman very famously does this in Six Easy Pieces, one of his early physics lectures. He basically explains mathematics in three pages. He starts from the number line counting and then he goes all the way up to percalculus. He just builds it up through an unbroken chain of logic. He doesn't rely on any definitions. The really smart thinkers are clear thinkers. They understand the basics at a very, very fundamental level. I would rather understand the basics really well than memorize all kinds of complicated concepts I can't stitch together and can't read rive from the basics. If you can't read rive concepts from the basics as you need them, you're lost you're just memorizing for the advanced concepts in a field are less proven we use them to signal insider knowledge but we'd be better off nailing the basics 11 clear thinkers appeal to their own authority part of making effective decisions boils down to dealing with reality how do you make sure you're dealing with reality when you're making decisions by not having a strong sense of self or judgments or mind presence the monkey mind will always respond with this regurgitated emotional response to what it thinks the world should be. Those desires will cloud your reality. This happens a lot of times when people are mixing politics and business. The number one thing clouding us from being able to see reality is we have preconceived notions of the way it should be. One definition of a moment of suffering is the moment when you see things exactly the way they are. This whole time, you've been convinced your business is doing great, and really, you've ignored the signs it's not doing well. Then, your business fails, and you suffer because you've been putting off reality. You've been hiding it from yourself. The good news is, the moment of suffering when you're in pain is a moment of truth. It is a moment where you're forced to embrace reality the way it actually is. Then, you can make meaningful change and progress. You can only make progress when you're starting with the truth. The hard thing is seeing the truth. To see the truth, you have to get your ego out of the way because your ego doesn't want to face the truth. The smaller you can make your ego, the less conditioned you can make your reactions, the less desires you can have about the outcome you want, the easier it will be to see the reality. What we wish to be true clouds our perception of what is true. Suffering is the moment when we can no longer deny reality. Imagine we're going through something difficult like a breakup, a job loss, a business failure, or a health problem, and our friends are advising us. 
when we're advising them, the answer is obvious. It comes to us in a minute, and we tell them exactly, oh that girl, get over her, she wasn't good for you anyway. You'll be happier. Trust me. You'll find someone. You know the correct answer, but your friend can't see it, because they're in the moment of suffering and pain. They're still wishing reality was different. The problem isn't reality. The problem is their desire is colliding with reality and preventing them from seeing the truth, no matter how much you say it. The same thing happens when I make decisions. The more desire I have for something to work out a certain way, the less likely I am to see the truth. Especially in business, if something isn't going well, I try to acknowledge it publicly and I try to acknowledge it publicly in front of my co-founders and friends and co-workers. Then, I'm not hiding it from anybody else. If I'm not hiding it from anybody, I'm not going to delude myself from what's actually going on. For what you feel tells you nothing about the facts it merely tells you something about your estimate of the facts. It's actually really important to have empty space. If you don't have a day or two every week in your calendar where you're not always in meetings, and you're not always busy, then you're not going to be able to think. You're not going to be able to have good ideas for your business. You're not going to be able to make good judgments. I also encourage taking at least one day a week, preferably two, because if you budget two, you'll end up with one, where you just have time to think. It's only after you're bored you have the great ideas. It's never going to be when you're stressed, or busy, running around or rushed. Make the time. 7. Very smart people tend to be weird since they insist on thinking everything through for themselves. A contrarian isn't one who always objects that's a conformist of a different sort. A contrarian reasons independently from the ground up and resists pressure to conform. Cynicism is easy. Mimicry is easy. Optimistic contrarians are the rarest breed. Shed your identity to see reality our egos are constructed in our formative years our first two decades. They get constructed by our environment, our parents, society. Then, we spend the rest of our life trying to make our ego happy. We interpret anything new through our ego, how do I change the external world to make it more how I would like it to be? Eight tension is who you think you should be. Relaxation is who you are. Buddhists saying you absolutely need habits to function. You cannot solve every problem in life as if it is the first time it's thrown at you. We accumulate all these habits. We put them in the bundle of identity, ego, ourselves, and then we get attached to them. I'm navel. This is the way I am. It's really important to be able to uncondition yourself, to be able to take your habits apart and say, okay, this is a habit I probably picked up when I was a toddler trying to get my parents' attention. Now I've reinforced it and reinforced it, and I call it a part of my identity. Does it still serve me? Does it make me happier? Does it make me healthier? Does it make me accomplish whatever I set out to accomplish? I'm less habitual than most people. I don't like to structure my day. To the extent I have habits, I try to make them more deliberate rather than accidents of history. For any belief you took in a package, EX Democrat, Catholic, American, is suspect and should be re-evaluated from base principles. I try not to have too much I pre-decided. I think creating identities and labels locks you in and keeps you from seeing the truth. To be honest, speak without identity. I used to identify as libertarian, but then I would find myself defending positions I hadn't really thought through because they're a part of the libertarian canon. If all your beliefs line up into neat little bundles, you should be highly suspicious. I don't like to self-identify on almost any level anymore which keeps me from having too many of these so-called stable beliefs. For we each have a contrarian belief society rejects. But the more our own identity and local tribe rejected, the more real it likely is. There are two attractive lessons about suffering in the long term. It can make you accept the world the way it is. 
The other lesson is it can make your ego change in an extremely hard way. Maybe you're a competitive athlete, and you get injured badly, like Bruce Lee. You have to accept being an athlete is not your entire identity, and maybe you can forge a new identity as a philosopher. 8 Facebook Redesigns Twitter Redesigns Personalities, careers, and teams also need redesigns. There are no permanent solutions in a dynamic system. Learn the skills of decision-making The classical virtues are all decision-making heuristics to make one optimize for the long-term rather than for the short-term. 11 Self-serving conclusions should have a higher bar. I do view a lot of my goals over the next few years of unconditioning previous learned responses or habituated responses, so I can make decisions more cleanly in the moment without relying on memory or pre-packaged heuristics and judgments. 4. Almost all biases are time-saving heuristics. For important decisions, discard memory and identity, and focus on the problem. Radical honesty just means I want to be free. Part of being free means I can say what I think and think what I say. They're highly congruent and integrated. Theoretical physicist Richard Feynman famously said, you should never, ever fool anybody, and you are the easiest person to fool. The moment you tell somebody something dishonest, you've lied to yourself. Then you'll start believing your own lie, which will disconnect you from reality and take you down the wrong road. I never ask if I like it or I don't like it. I think this is what it is or this is what it isn't. Richard Feynman it's really important for me to be honest. I don't go out of my way volunteering negative or nasty things. I would combine radical honesty with an old rule Warren Buffett has, which is praise specifically, criticize generally. I try to follow this. I don't always follow it, but I think I follow it enough to have made a difference in my life. If you have a criticism of someone, then don't criticize the person criticize the general approach or criticize the class of activities. If you have to praise somebody, then always try and find the person who is the best example of what you're praising and praise the person, specifically. Then people's egos and identities, which we all have, don't work against you. They work for you. For any advice on developing capacity for instinctual blunt honesty? Tell everyone. Start now. It doesn't have to be blunt. Charisma is the ability to project confidence and love at the same time. It's almost always possible to be honest and positive. 71 As an investor and CEO of Angel List, you're paid to be right when other people are wrong. Do you have a process around how you make decisions? Yes. Decision making is everything. In fact, Someone who makes decisions right 80% of the time instead of 70% of the time will be valued and compensated in the market hundreds of times more. I think people have a hard time understanding a fundamental fact of leverage. If I manage $1 billion and I'm right 10% more often than somebody else, my decision making creates $100 million worth of value on a judgment call. With modern technology and large workforces and capital, our decisions are leveraged more and more. If you can be more right and more rational, you're going to get nonlinear returns in your life. I love the blog Farnham Street because it really focuses on helping you be more accurate, an overall better decision maker. Decision making is everything. For the more you know, the less you diversify. Collect mental models during decision making, the brain is a memory prediction machine. A lousy way to do memory prediction is X happened in the past, therefore X will happen in the future. It's too based on specific circumstances. What you want is principles. You want mental models. The best mental models I have found came through evolution, game theory, and Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's partner. Very good investor. He has tons and tons of great mental models. Author and Trader Nassim Taleb has great mental models. Benjamin Franklin had great mental models. I basically load my head full of mental models. For I use my tweets and other people's tweets as maxims that help compress my own learnings and recall them.
The brain space is finite you have finite neurons so you can almost think of these as pointers, addresses, or mnemonics to help you remember deep-seated principles where you have the underlying experience to back it up. If you don't have the underlying experience, then it just reads like a collection of quotes. It's cool, it's inspirational for a moment, maybe you'll make a nice poster out of it. But then you forget it and move on. Mental models are really just compact ways for you to recall your own knowledge. 78 Evolution I think a lot of modern society can be explained through evolution. One theory is civilization exists to answer the question of who gets to mate. If you look around, from a purely sexual selection perspective, sperm is abundant and eggs are scarce. It's an allocation problem. Literally all of the works of mankind and womankind can be traced down to people trying to solve this problem. Evolution, thermodynamics, information theory, and complexity have explanatory and predictive power in many aspects of life. 11 Inversion I don't believe I have the ability to say what is going to work. Rather, I try to eliminate what's not going to work. I think being successful is just about not making mistakes. It's not about having correct judgment. It's about avoiding incorrect judgments. For complexity theory. I was really into complexity theory back in the mid 90s. The more I got into it, the more I understand the limits of our knowledge and the limits of our prediction capability. Complexity has been super helpful to me. It has helped me come to a system that operates in the face of ignorance. I believe we are fundamentally ignorant and very, very bad at predicting the future. For economics, microeconomics and game theory are fundamental. I don't think you can be successful in business or even navigate most of our modern capitalist society without an extremely good understanding of supply and demand, labor versus capital, game theory, and those kinds of things. For ignore the noise. The market will decide. Principal agent problem to me, the principal agent problem is the single most fundamental problem in microeconomics. If you do not understand the principal agent problem, you will not know how to navigate your way through the world. It is important if you want to build a successful company or be successful in your dealings. It's a very simple concept. Julius Caesar famously said, if you want it done, then go. And if not, then send. What he meant was, if you want it done right, then you have to go yourself and do it. When you are the principal, then you are the owner you care, and you will do a great job. When you are the agent and you are doing it on somebody else's behalf, you can do a bad job. You just don't care. You optimize for yourself rather than for the principal's assets. The smaller the company, the more everyone feels like a principal. The less you feel like an agent, the better the job you're going to do. The more closely you can tie someone's compensation to the exact value they're creating, the more you turn them into a principal, and the less you turn them into an agent. 12 I think at a core fundamental level, we understand this. We're attracted to principles, and we all bond with principles, but the media and modern society spend a lot of time brainwashing you about needing an agent, an agent being important, and the agent being knowledgeable. 12 Compound Interest Compound Interest Most of you should know it in the finance context. If you don't, crack open a microeconomics textbook. It's worth reading a microeconomics textbook from start to finish. An example of compound interest let's say you're earning 10% a year on your $1. The first year, you make 10%, and you end up with $1.10. The next year, you end up with $1.21, and the next year $1.33. It keeps adding onto itself. If you're compounding at 30% per year for 30 years, you don't just end up with 10 or 20 times your money you end up with thousands of times your money. 10 in the intellectual domain, Compound interest rules. When you look at a business with 100 users growing at a compound rate of 20% per month, it can very, very quickly stack up to having millions of users. Sometimes, even the founders of these companies are surprised by how large the business scales. 
10 basic math I think basic mathematics is really underrated. If you're going to make money, if you're going to invest money, your basic math should be really good. You don't need to learn geometry, trigonometry, calculus, or any of the complicated stuff if you're just going into business. But you want arithmetic, probability, and statistics. Those are extremely important. Crack open a basic math book, and make sure you are really good at multiplying, dividing, compounding, probability, and statistics. Black Swans there's a new branch of probability statistics, which is really around tail events. Black Swans are extreme probabilities. Again, I have to refer back to Nassim Taleb, who I think is one of the greatest philosopher scientists of our times. He's really done a lot of pioneering work on this. Calculus Calculus is useful to know, to understand the rates of change and how nature works. But it's more important to understand the principles of calculus where you're measuring the change in small discrete or small continuous events. It's not important you solve integrals or do derivations on demand, because you're not going to need to in the business world. Falsifiability least understood but the most important principle for anyone claiming science on their side falsifiability. If it doesn't make falsifiable predictions, it's not science. For you to believe something is true, it should have predictive power, and it must be falsifiable. 11 I think macroeconomics, because it doesn't make falsifiable predictions, which is the hallmark of science, has become corrupted. You never have a counterexample when studying the economy. You can never take the US economy and run two different experiments at the same time. For if you can't decide, the answer is no. If I'm faced with a difficult choice, such as, should I marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I buy this house? Should I move to the city? Should I go into business with this person? If you cannot decide, the answer is no. And the reason is, Modern society is full of options. There are tons and tons of options. We live on a planet of 7 billion people, and we are connected to everybody on the internet. There are hundreds of thousands of careers available to you. There are so many choices. You're biologically not built to realize how many choices there are. Historically, we've all evolved in tribes of 150 people. When someone comes along, they may be your only option for a partner. When you choose something, you get locked in for a long time. Starting a business may take 10 years. You start a relationship that will be 5 years or maybe more. You move to a city for 10 to 20 years. These are very, very long-lived decisions. It's very, very important we only say yes when we are pretty certain. You're never going to be absolutely certain but you're going to be very certain. If you find yourself creating a spreadsheet for a decision with a list of yes and no's, pros and cons, checks and balances, why this is good or bad, forget it. If you cannot decide, the answer is no. 10 run uphill simple heuristic, if you're evenly split on a difficult decision, take the path more painful in the short term. If you have two choices to make, and they're relatively equal choices, take the path more difficult and more painful in the short term. What's actually going on is one of these paths requires short term pain. And the other path leads to pain further out in the future. And what your brain is doing through conflict avoidance is trying to push off the short term pain. By definition, if the two are even and one has short term pain, that path has long term gain associated. With the law of compound interest, long term, Gain is what you want to go toward. Your brain is overvaluing the side with the short-term happiness and trying to avoid the one with short-term pain. So you have to cancel the tendency out, it's a powerful subconscious tendency, by leaning into the pain. As you know, most of the gains in life come from suffering in the short term so you can get paid in the long term. Working out for me is not fun, I suffer in the short term, I feel pain. But then in the long term, I'm better off because I have muscles or I'm healthier. If I am reading a book and I'm getting confused, 
it is just like working out and the muscle getting sore or tired, except now my brain is being overwhelmed. In the long run I'm getting smarter because I'm absorbing new concepts from working at the limit or edge of my capability. So you generally want to lean into things with short-term pain, but long-term gain. What are the most efficient ways to build new mental models? Read a lot just read. 2. Reading science, math, and philosophy 1 hour per day will likely put you at the upper echelon of human success within 7 years. Learn to love to read. Specific recommendations for books, blogs, and more are in Navel's recommended reading section. The genuine love for reading itself, when cultivated, is a superpower. We live in the age of Alexandria, when every book and every piece of knowledge ever written down is a fingertip away. The means of learning are abundant it's the desire to learn that is scarce. 3. Reading was my RST love. 4. I remember my grandparents house in India. I'd be a little kid on the floor going through all of my grandfather's readers digests, which is all he had to read. Now, of course, there's a smorgasbord of information out there anybody can read anything all the time. Back then, it was much more limited. I would read comic books, story books, whatever I could get my hands on. I think I always loved to read because I'm actually an antisocial introvert. I was lost in the world of words and ideas from an early age. I think some of it comes from the happy circumstance that when I was young, nobody forced me to read certain things. I think there's a tendency among parents and teachers to say, oh, you should read this, but don't read that. I read a lot which, by today's standards, would be considered mental junk food. 4. Read what you love until you love to read. You almost have to read the stuff you're reading, because you're into it. You don't need any other reason. There's no mission here to accomplish. Just read because you enjoy it. These days, I find myself rereading as much, or more, as I do reading. A tweet from Adelacerda said, I don't want to read everything. I just want to read the 100 great books over and over again. I think there's a lot to that idea. It's really more about identifying the great books for you because different books speak to different people. Then, you can really absorb those. Reading a book isn't a race the better the book, the more slowly it should be absorbed. I don't know about you, but I have very poor attention. I skim. I speed read. I jump around. I could not tell you specific passages or quotes from books. At some deep level, you absorb them, and they become threads in the tapestry of your psyche. They kind of weave in there. I'm sure you've had this feeling where you pick up a book and start reading it, and you're like, this is pretty interesting. This is pretty good. You're getting this increasing sense of deja vu. Then halfway through the book, you realize, I've read this book before. That's perfectly fine. It means you were ready to reread it. For I don't actually read a lot of books. I pick up a lot of books and only get through a few which form the foundation of my knowledge. The reality is, I don't actually read much compared to what people think. I probably read one to two hours a day. That puts me in the top 0.00001%. I think that alone accounts for any material success I've had in my life and any intelligence I might have. Real people don't read an hour a day. Real people, I think, read a minute a day or less. Making it an actual habit is the most important thing. It almost doesn't matter what you read. Eventually, you will read enough things, and your interests will lead you there that it will dramatically improve your life. Just like the best workout for you is one you're excited enough to do every day, I would say for books, blogs, tweets, or whatever anything with ideas and information and learning the best ones to read are the ones you're excited about reading all the time. For as long as I have a book in my hand, I don't feel like I'm wasting time. Charlie Munger everyone's brain works differently. Some people love to take notes. Actually, my note-taking is Twitter. I read and read and read. If I have some fundamental aha insight or concept, 
Twitter forces me to distill it into a few characters. Then I try and put it out there as an aphorism. Then I get attacked by random people who point out all kinds of obvious exceptions and jump down my throat. Then I think, why did I do this again? For pointing out obvious exceptions implies either the target isn't smart or you aren't. When you first pick up a book, are you skimming for something interesting? How do you go about reading it? Do you just flip to a random page and start reading? What's your process? I'll start at the beginning, but I'll move fast. If it's not interesting, I'll just start flipping ahead, skimming, or speed reading. If it doesn't grab my attention within the first chapter in a meaningful, positive way, I'll either drop the book or skip ahead a few chapters. I don't believe in delayed gratification when there are an infinite number of books out there to read. There are so many great books. The number of books completed is a vanity metric. As you know more, you leave more books unished. Focus on new concepts with predictive power. Generally, I'll skip. I'll fast forward. I'll try and find a part to catch my attention. Most books have one point to make. Obviously, this is non-fiction. I'm not talking about fiction. They have one point to make, they make it, and then they give you example after example after example after example, and they apply it to explain everything in the world. Once I feel like I've gotten the gist, I feel very comfortable putting the book down. There's a lot of these, what I would call pseudoscience bestsellers, people are like, oh, did you read this book? I always say yes, but the reality is I read maybe two chapters of it. I got the gist. If they wrote it to make money, don't read it. What practices do you follow to internalize slash organize information from reading books? Explain what you learned to someone else. Teaching forces learning. It's not about educated versus uneducated. It's about likes to read and doesn't like to read. What can I do for the next 60 days to become a clearer, more independent thinker? Read the greats in math, science, and philosophy. Ignore your contemporaries and news. Avoid tribal identification. Put truth above social approval. 11. Study logic and math, because once you've mastered them, you won't fear any book. No book in the library should scare you. Whether it's a math, physics, electrical engineering, sociology, or economics book. You should be able to take any book down off the shelf and read it. A number of them are going to be too difficult for you. That's okay read them anyway. Then go back and reread them and reread them. When you're reading a book and you're confused, that confusion is similar to the pain you get in the gym when you're working out. But you're building mental muscles instead of physical muscles. Learn how to learn and read the books. The problem with saying just read is there is so much junk out there. There are as many different kinds of authors as there are people. Many of them are going to write lots of junk. I have people in my life I consider to be very well read who aren't very smart. The reason is because even though they're very well read, they read the wrong things in the wrong order. They started out reading a set of false or just weekly true things, and those formed the axioms of the foundation for their worldview. Then, when new things come, they judge the new idea based on a foundation they already built. Your foundation is critical. Because most people are intimidated by math and can't independently critique it, they overvalue opinions backed with math slash pseudoscience. When it comes to reading, make sure your foundation is very, very high quality. The best way to have a high quality foundation, you may not love this answer, but the trick is to stick to science and to stick to the basics. Generally, there are only a few things you can read people don't disagree with. Very few people disagree 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? That is serious knowledge. Mathematics is a solid foundation. Similarly, the hard sciences are a solid foundation. Microeconomics is a solid foundation. The moment you start wandering outside of these solid foundations you're in trouble because now you don't know what's true and what's false. 
I would focus as much as I could on having solid foundations. It's better to be really great at arithmetic and geometry than to be deep into advanced mathematics. I would read microeconomics all day long microeconomics 101. Another way to do this is to read originals and read classics. If you're interested in evolution, read Charles Darwin. Don't begin with Richard Dawkins, even though I think he's great. Read him later, read Darwin first. If you want to learn macroeconomics, first read Adam Smith, read Von Mises, or Red Hayek. Start with the original philosophers of the economy. If you're into communist or socialist ideas, which I'm personally not, start by reading Karl Marx. Don't read the current interpretation someone is feeding you about how things should be done and run. If you start with the originals as your foundations, then you have enough of a worldview and understanding that you won't fear any book. Then you can just learn. If you're a perpetual learning machine, you will never be out of options for how to make money. You can always see what's coming up in society, what the value is, where the demand is, and you can learn to come up to speed. 74 to think clearly, understand the basics. If you're memorizing advanced concepts without being able to rederive them as needed, you're lost. We're now in a day and age of Twitter and Facebook. We're getting bite-sized, pithy wisdom, which is really hard to absorb. Books are very difficult to read as a modern person because we've been trained. We have two contradictory pieces of training, one is our attention span has gone through the floor because we're hit with so much information all the time. We want to skip, summarize, and cut to the chase. Twitter has made me a worse reader but a much better writer. On the other hand, we're also taught from a young age to finish your books. Books are sacred when you go to school and you're assigned to read a book, you have to finish the book. Over time, we forget how to read books. Everyone I know is stuck on some book. I'm sure you're stuck on something right now it's page 332. You can't go any further, but you know you should finish the book. So what do you do? You give up reading books for a while. For me, giving up reading was a tragedy. I grew up on books, then I switched to blogs, then I switched to Twitter and Facebook, and I realized I wasn't actually learning anything. I was just taking little dopamine snacks all day long. I was getting my little 140 character burst of dopamine. I would tweet, then look to see who retweeted my tweet. It's a fun and wonderful thing, but it's a game I was playing. I realized I had to go back to reading books. 6. I knew it was a very hard problem because my brain had now been trained to spend time on Facebook, Twitter, and these other bite-sized pieces. I came up with this hack where I started treating books as throwaway blog posts or bite-sized tweets or posts. I felt no obligation to finish any book. Now, when someone mentions a book to me, I buy it. At any given time, I'm reading somewhere between 10 and 20 books. I'm flipping through them. If the book is getting a little boring, I'll skip ahead. Sometimes, I start reading a book in the middle because some paragraph caught my eye. I'll just continue from there, and I feel no obligation whatsoever to finish the book. All of a sudden, books are back into my reading library. That's great, because there is ancient wisdom in books. 6. When solving problems, the older the problem, the older the solution. If you're trying to learn how to drive a car or fly a plane, you should read something written in the modern age because this problem was created in the modern age and the solution is great in the modern age. If you're talking about an old problem like how to keep your body healthy, how to stay calm and peaceful, what kinds of value systems are good, how you raise a family, and those kinds of things, the older solutions are probably better. Any book that survived for 2000 years has been filtered through many people. The general principles are more likely to be correct. I wanted to get back into reading these sorts of books. 6. You know that song you can't get out of your head? All thoughts work that way. Careful what you read. A calm mind, a tea body, and a house full of love. 
These things cannot be bought. They must be earned.